Uh, just as a personal example, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. I was 29 and um, starting to age out of my dance career. And I um, had a tremendous amount of pain. And the orthopedic surgeon that I saw said, well, come back to me when you're ready for surgery. And he, I said, how will I know? He said, you'll know. 10 years later, I couldn't use my right leg. So how, and then I did actually end up having a discectomy. So how often do you think with proper care could, I mean, obviously, um, maybe it's not obvious. There's a lot of people out there that have uh, herniations that never need surgery, never have pain. So how often when you have someone that had a condition like mine where there's a lot of um, radiating symptoms, do we actually need surgery or could we, maybe care for them, um, or could good care have taken care of the problem? <laughs> Proper I know, care. Uh, I, I know exactly, Karina, because I'm the only clinician that I know of that's measured it. We measured and followed up with every single patient we saw over my full career at the university. I know exactly the score. So of the patients, who, who they typically say, well, I've tried everything. I've tried chiropractic, physical therapy, uh, yoga and Pilates. I've been to the shrink and I've had my orthopedic consult and apparently I've failed at all. And the only thing left for me is surgery. When they came to the clinic with that background, we got 95% of them to avoid surgery and they were happy for it. Ah, oh, fantastic. Yeah, so I think- I, I can give you that statistic. Um, and it really comes from understanding what is the mechanism of their pain. Now, uh, the, again, a disc bulge, that's a very generic term. There's subcategories of disc bulges. We know that if the person has 70% of their disc height remaining or more, that usually a directional therapy uh, sometimes combined with motion and traction, sometimes not, but uh, we, we can really uh, vacuum in uh, the disc bulge. If it's mm -hmm. walled off and plugged, we don't. But then to uh, perhaps in that individual, we might try some nerve flossing and mm -hmm. getting the nerve to floss by the impinged area that uh, is compromised with the disc bulge. Uh, that works uh, quite often as well, but you have to sow the seeds. You just can't say to the person, well, do nerve flossing. We might say, lay on your tummy for five minutes. That helps to decompress the, the hydraulic effort on the posterior bulge. And then we'll try uh, 10 repetitions of uh, nerve flossing uh, and uh, go on from there. But anyway, uh, there's the statistic to answer the question with a little bit of um, a thought on how we might go, go about uh, achieving that 19 out of 20 people. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's great to know. I wish I've, I saw you 20 years ago. <laughs> did, you, did you say that again? The what? I said, I wish I saw you 20 years ago. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. I, um, I, I do tell people that see me now that they, um, when they ask my thought on surgery, you know, when I went in to see the surgeon, um, I was barely walking and I had been barely walking for quite a while. And um, he gave me a time limit. You know, there was a time limit on how long I could go without having surgery before these symptoms were permanent and I would be dragging my leg behind me the rest of my life. Um, is that how that scenario generally goes if that right leg or left leg isn't working due to symptoms in the spine that it's just never going to come back unless we get that pressure off of the nerve how does that usually how's that go well there are cases where that is true there's no question but there are many cases where it's very false okay so on a case by case basis but we will know fairly quickly if the person is going to respond or not we use the principles of what we call spine hygiene. We define the mechanical driver of the disc bulge, if that's what we're talking about, if that's the target for the knife in the surgeon's hands, if it's a disc bulge. Uh, we will try to uh, decompress the disc bulge by stopping the offense, whether it's 
directionally driven hydraulic pressure in the nucleus, whether the annulus has been, <coughs> excuse me, uh, delaminated or whatever it is. And then um, we get, we, 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 we coach them to move in a way that stops that mechanism mm -hmm. of hygiene. And uh, for example, I can get out of the chair. If I had a posterior disc bulge, I can flex forward and get out of the chair. Well, I just pressurized the posterior disc bulge. But if I did the opposite, if I sniffed some air first, and now I lean forward through the hips, I just, I just completely eliminated the um, offense. Uh, I don't know if you can see here, but on my shelf in the clinic, I have many, many different models of different mechanisms of uh, pain. So the one I just described, and this might not be too unfamiliar to you, can you see the little red deformation at the end of my finger? Yes. Now just watch, I'm going to flex forward and squeeze. Do you see the nuclear material being driven posteriorly because of the hydraulic effort? It's posterior. It's squeezed and flexed. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to stack the spine tall and I'm going to squeeze. But do you see when I squeeze, nothing comes out uh, of the laminated collagen and it's pure hydraulics. Okay. You see, if I want to squeeze an orange seed, uh, that way, I bias the pressure and it goes out that way every time. So that's what posture does. So again, this idea that posture doesn't matter, it's uh, causing a lot of grief for people who have very specific types of posturally driven mechanisms. So that would be one of them. Yeah. But uh, that uh, delamination that I showed you, if you stop creating the hydraulic pressure and separating the collagen fibers, uh, it will gristle. And then over time, you, you build a resilience. So there's, uh, you know, I, I think I have Olympians uh, uh, in just about every Olympic endeavor, people active in, in all of the big professional sports with quite uh, interesting and large disc bulges. They mm -hmm. were able to uh, A, reduce the bulge, B, reduce the pain sensitization and regain their athleticism sufficient to compete. Now, yeah. can they, are they absolutely bulletproof? No, they do have to manage it, but if they are skilled uh, and well coached, uh, most of them are able to manage uh, these challenges to subclinical levels. So they're mm -hmm. winning, winning medals, uh, many millions of dollars in salary and all the rest. Yeah. Of yeah. So is that part of an uh, ongoing uh, lifestyle for these uh, people that you work with? Is the, is it, uh, does it, does there come a time when we, those of us with back pain, the, your patients with back pain, they just go on their normal life or is it always going to be, there's a regimen for your back pain or there's a regimen for not returning to that life, to that type of pain? Well, let me ask you two questions. So you're a former athlete as a, a professional dancer. Do you know of a professional dancer who is not managing something? Are I, all perfectly healthy? I do not. <laughs> okay, I do not know of a professional athlete who isn't managing something. So there's, there's the answer. Uh, the ones who are successful at life are the ones who are the successful manager of stress, be it psychological, be it physical, and allow that stress to build your body, body rather than crossing the tipping point so it tears you down. It's an optimal function. You've got to stay on the proper side of the tipping point. Tipping point. So anybody can cross the tipping point by being either irresponsible, ill-informed, or unskilled. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would love to go and do uh, uh, crazy things and have all the athleticism I had in my 20s. Yeah. The reality of it is if I did that, I'd be uh, crippled and, and yeah. everyone else would be as well. So yeah. 
but our job is to know how to expand the area and the capacity under that tipping point. So now the person gets to play pickup basketball with their grandchildren. They get back on the golf course. They get to ride their bike and swim and, and really have fun with life. And that, that, that's the key to it all. But okay. can they go back and, and go crazy? Uh, no one can. There's always a biological limit. There's a biological limit. Yes. 